All right. So last time I ended with this uh, view of a uh, what's called a stacking chart. And that's basically how you figure out um, from the geometry of a 2D survey where the, the midpoints are and, and uh, where you can slice the 3D data volume to get uh, these different uh, types of gathers that I was talking about. And um, so let's uh, just review and, and make sure that we all understand um, uh, what's being shown here. We have a, um, a source uh, which is pushing a, uh, a mere six channel uh, line down uh, to the right. Um, and so the first source is at uh, uh, source x coordinate. You know, they're all the sources, the midpoints, the offsets, the geophones, they're, they're all on the x axis, right? So they all have x axis coordinates. So what may we have this? Uh, Source at uh, x coordinate one, okay, and then we have a uh, uh, the first of the six receivers is is at x coordinate. Let's say that's four, and then uh, six, eight, ten, twelve, uh, and uh, fourteen. So um, we have uh, uh, those are the g coordinates, and these little uh, black dots with the uh, the red around them. Each of those represents uh, the location, the S and G location of one seismogram, one trace in our in our in our data set, in our multi-offset data set, uh, which is going to be three D. Because okay, we move the line along, we move the source to uh, S equals two, say, and um, you know here's the uh, here's the uh, uh, the geophone at uh, uh, five and seven and nine and eleven and thirteen and fifteen. Okay, so um, you know we've moved the whole survey, uh, the the source, the receivers, the cable. Uh, you know everything is moved on down the x-axis, and so we're building up this. Um, you know as we continue to move move the survey along, it's a roll along survey as as I would call it. Um, you know we're we're going to be building um, more points. You know higher on the uh, on the s axis, and since the the they're moving along, since the sources are moving along, they're going to be further to the right along the g axis. Okay, and so you can see this uh, sort of trapezoidal shape, not trapezoid, uh, rhomboidal shape maybe, um, or a, a, usually it's a parallelogram shape. Because every source, of course, as as uh, you guys well know, is recorded by multiple geophones. That's the easiest way to do it. Um, I suppose there's some other world where, uh, you know, uh, it's easier to record uh, multiple sources with one geophone. Uh, that would be uh, that would be ocean bottom surveys, uh, where the uh, the geophone is very difficult and expensive to place on the seafloor. And then uh, you can shoot uh, millions of uh, sources above it with a boat. Um, so yes, uh, it doesn't even have to be another world; it just has to be offshore, uh, where we would be doing a different thing. But for our uh, our typical land surveys that, uh, uh, and 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 the typical uh, kind of um, you know cable pulling, uh, streamer pulling, uh, uh, offshore survey, this is a very good uh, uh, kind of diagram. All right, so. Um, you know, if we take the source at at one and, and the uh, and the geophone at uh, at fourteen, um, where is the midpoint? Well, it's uh, it's going to be at uh, thirteen minus one over two, right? Um, no, uh, thirteen plus one over two, uh, so it's going to be at seven. So the midpoint will be there, okay. Uh, so that's uh, you know we'll circle this. That's got a midpoint at seven, and if we look for you know elsewhere in the data set for other traces with the same midpoint, you know we we uh, we could have this. Um, let's see if I guess it right. Uh, uh, probably won't guess it right, but uh, you know there's other trace here that's uh, maybe at um, uh, the source is uh, at uh, three, and the um, 
and that one's uh, uh, midpoint is going to be at let's see. Um, uh, uh, well, I'd, I'd have to work it out, but you know we get the same midpoint as uh, uh, of seven. So you circle those two traces, and then suddenly, oh, you know we know that that's the common midpoint direction. Okay, and I've I've written common midpoint along here in that uh, direction. Assume you know if I'd use graph paper, then everything would come out square, um, and everything would be in the right uh, the right direction. Uh, but I think that's pretty good for a, a rough sketch. So um, you know, here are the names of the um, of the different gathers and the direction now that we know that they are. Now that we know that that all of these are, uh, you know, this is the common midpoint direction, whether it's here or you know the midpoint uh, further along in X would be up here, but still the slice is in the same direction. And down here, the midpoint would be closer to uh, one, and the slice is still in the same direction. So those are all. You know, just slicing this volume, collecting together the traces that have the same midpoint, those are um, those are now um, uh, defining axes where um, uh, you know perpendicular to this direction of common midpoint. That's the midpoint axis, right? So you know here uh, you know we project uh, these two stations and and all the others that have that same midpoint to this axis perpendicularly. <coughs> And so that's you know going to be seven on the midpoint axis, and um, you know up here would be uh, probably seven and a half or eight on the midpoint axis, and and so forth. So uh, the the axis of increasing midpoint is just a rotation of the s axis, and what's the axis that's uh, in the direction of of the uh, common midpoints? Well, that's the offset axis. The or as we're calling it, the half offset h. Okay, so the the midpoint and the and the the m and h axes are perpendicular to each other, just like the s and g axes are perpendicular to each other. And depending on exactly you know what's the source interval, what's the receiver interval, how many stations you have, you know what's the uh, uh, and all that, you can work out what the rotation is between the uh, for this for any given stacking chart, the rotation between the the uh, M and H axes and the S and G axes, and you can uh, then just identify in what direction. For instance, a common geophone gather would be uh, straight up and down. All the all the geophones that are uh, straight up and down. Um, a common shot gather, of course, which is the physical experiment, is uh, this gather that's uh, horizontal. All the traces that are horizontal um, for any given shot. Um, a common offset gather, of course, is just perpendicular to a common um, midpoint gather. Um, so all of these are uh, uh, just ways of sorting out the data, and you know, for you to figure out, uh, you know, first how to collect a particular data set with particular objectives, and second. Uh, you know how to look for particular phenomena, like I discussed last time, that are better in some axes than uh, in some gathers than than others. And and uh, other there are other things that you know may be invisible in one axis and are better in uh, in others. And and of course you can uh, assemble you know multiple slices in one direction um, into a uh, into a movie. Now here's uh, uh, just to um, Illustrate what happens when you um, um, uh, when we when we actually make a volume out of a out of a, a multi-offset data set uh, of of traces. Right, each of these each of these dots is the head of a trace, and you can think of those of the dots as as uh, you know hanging into the board or or into the screen there. Um, and we're just looking at the top of the data volume and seeing the locations, the uh, the M and H or the S and G coordinates of each uh, uh, of each uh, um, uh, uh, of each uh, uh, seismogram. So um, what we uh, what we often are faced with is uh, when we look at a, a data volume in um, uh, in the, the kinds of uh, 3D visualization software that uh, 
we've had for uh, some time, um, it straightens the sides. It takes this, uh, this rhombus and it just straightens it out. So I've done that to the image of the shot of the uh, stacking chart. And uh, just to show that then all the axes get, uh, get tilted, the common shot gather is still, is still horizontal. Uh, but now it's the common offset gather that is vertical. The common geophone gather for this row along survey is, uh, is now at an angle. The common midpoint gather is cutting through at a, at a slightly different angle. Okay. So we've just straightened the sides of the stacking chart uh, and, uh, and straightened the sides of the, uh, of the data volume like a deck of cards. Each card is a shot record. And, and so uh, we can still recognize you know, what directions to take the uh, different gathers in. OK. Now I'm going to uh, I'm going to illustrate this um, by uh, with a with a synthetic example in a little bit, but uh, first we need to talk about um, what exactly are we looking for in a common offset in a um, uh, multi offset data set. All right, and that's a very important discussion. So what we would like to be able to handle is a situation where we have randomly located point scatters. We would like to image structure you know, without regard, arbitrary structure without regard to how well it's organized. So we've got to go way beyond layer cake geology. We, we acknowledged that back in, in 706 class. Um, and uh, we've, got to, um, uh, we've got to also um, um, go beyond uh, uh, eventually, you know, these simple two-dimensional um, models um, where we have a, a two-dimensional world, and we've also got to go beyond the uh, <clears throat> um, the concepts that we had of um, um, uh, uh, of of uh, very simple, uh, you know, planar structures. We want a, a structure that's, you know, coherent or not. Uh, that's curved or not, uh, you know that that can be anywhere in the uh, in the volume. So let's say uh, you know we, we have some sources and receivers here on the surface of the Earth, um, and so you see the x and the z axes, and the um, the reflectivity is basically just random. You know, as a function of x and z, of course not time. The reflect the reflection coefficient, the reflectivity. Is uh, is random, so the um, uh, and and then we are going to keep the velocity a little bit simpler. Okay, um, we'll keep uh, uh, velocity maybe is going to as as we developed with the uh, thin lens term. If you remember from seven oh six, we advanced the concept of a horizontally averaged velocity. So velocity can vary. However, it does in Z. There can be low velocity zones. There can be sharp contrasts. There can be gradients. All of those in in Z in the depth dimension. Uh, but in X, there's no variation. Okay, and and you recall how that uh, you know if we if we made that assumption um, that velocity varied only extremely slowly with X, and maybe not at all. Um, you know, then uh, then we could come up with a migration that that adjusts for it uh, quite well, uh, and you uh, exercise that in your in your lab eight of uh, of uh, uh, seven oh six. Okay, so so um, we have these uh, these assumptions, and any any given seismogram is going to look like a random series, and a properly migrated zero offset section. Will also look like a two D random random series, and we just wonder, you know, this looks like a lot of our uh, zero offset sections in our data sets. Okay, um, we also wonder, uh, you know, is it just all random noise associated with the recording environment? Are we looking all all at, uh, you know, surface waves, air waves, uh, you know, vibrator uh, hopping, and and all that sort of thing? Um, so. Um, uh, you know the the uh, the zero offset recording is not telling us everything that we need to know. Okay, um, 
on the other hand, you could have this random section, okay, from a random you know well log, and uh, and you can you can record multi-offset data and sort it into common midpoint sections, CMP gathers, okay, and you will see coherent hyperbolas. And in fact, uh, um, in uh, even even in three D, okay. The top of each hyperbola or a hyperboloid will be um, will be at exactly zero h. Okay, so all the hyperbolas will be symmetric about the time axis and symmetric about zero offset. And so every one of those hyperbolas can help us to uh, to determine velocity. And I, I think uh, uh, I, I think I'll dare say that uh, you know with Satish. Uh, uh, seeing this lecture, and uh, um, and then going into the field and recording reflection data in these supposedly opaque Great Basin uh, geothermal prospects, uh, you know, seismically opaque geothermal prospects, and seeing, yeah, the the stack, the zero offset section, um, the uh, the process sections, the migrated sections, they all look like junk. They all look like noise. All right. But he could see that in the original shot gathers, in the no, no, not not even uh, so coherently in the original shot gathers, in the in the common midpoint sections, when he sorted out his data into common midpoint sections, Satish and Bill saw that um, uh, that their uh, their surveys were yielding excellent coherent data, and every one of those hyperbolas has something to say about velocity. Okay, it's just a matter of figuring it out. All right, and something to say about the reflectivity of the Earth. So that was really the start of, of all of the geothermal work that uh, that Optum was able to do in the last fifteen years. So um, uh, you know, if you um, if you uh, if you get a zero offset section in the field and it looks like junk, okay, uh, you've just got a geologically complex environment. If you um, if you look at your shot gathers and uh, and you see uh, you know kind of discontinuous hyperbolas uh, cast everywhere and bow tying everywhere and all sorts of different slopes and uh, and uh, uh, coming to apexes at uh, all sorts of different places, uh, then you know that you're probably um, you're probably recording some uh, uh, some real reflections. And if you sort it into common midpoint gathers, and you see then these coherent hyperbolas, every one of them uh, uh, centered around zero offset, uh, then you know you have a wonderful data set it's, that's going to tell you a lot. Uh, even though you know all the uh, all the folks who had tried before had given up and gone home. Okay, all they were doing was ignoring the data that they had. Uh, they may not have been recording it properly either, but uh, you know that's uh, that's another thing. All right, so here's a, a very simple synthetic example, uh, you know, verging on layer cake uh, geology. So we have a um, uh, a depth section, and um, and then here's uh, the section is 250 meters wide. We're just in a 2D world here. Uh, we've got uh, some different uh, geological layers. There's this uh, lower velocity uh, layer at the surface. Um, there's this, uh, let's call it a, uh, a, a basin. And uh, then there's this uh, layer, uh, this green layer that, uh, uh, you know, between the, uh, uh, the it, it as a basement and the uh, basin in blue, it's really just a density contrast. It's not a velocity contrast. In fact, there's uh, this, it's all density contrast in here. This is uh, constant velocity. Uh, now I'm remembering, and then we've got a deep flat reflector here. So we got two flat reflectors near the top and at the bottom, and then uh, a, uh, a dipping reflector. All right, and so we put uh, acoustic waves through that simple that simple model, uh, and you can see some of the artifacts in here. And this this is a zero offset section now. Uh, you know, it's true, clean, zero offset data. There's the the you know the red and blue stripe at the top is the source going off at zero time. 
Uh, you can see uh, reflections from the corners where the uh, the edge of the model meets the uh, um, uh, the the layers meet the the layer uh, reflectors meet the edge of the model, and they form a nice little diffraction there. Um, you can see a uh, notice that uh, this kind of dim reflection here is at exactly twice the time of the uh, upper flat reflector. So that's a first multiple of that reflector. There's a, uh, a second multiple of the flat reflector at, a, at exactly three times the time. Um, here's a, uh, uh, the, the, the dipping reflection. okay, And a multiple of it looks like uh, it's at uh, a time that is uh, um, a, uh, 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 basically a, a surface multiple of that uh, of that time, you know, basically an extra bounce between the uh, the surface and the and the first flat reflector, which is the strongest one, and then kind of dimly here we see the uh, the flat reflector near the bottom. Okay, so uh, now I'll record a uh, multi-offset data set. There are uh, uh, sources all through here, and the receiver line, which you can not quite see back there. Moves along to the right as well. So the very last sort, the very first source is here. The receivers are uh, are are through there, and the very last source is there, and the receivers are from there to there. So we're not quite going to the edges of the model, um, which is good because you know we have trouble with the the edges. We talked about boundary conditions for uh, migrations in seven oh six. Um, here's a uh, a common midpoint stack. Of the multi-offset data, you can see that the uh, uh, it's uh, uh, done a little bit, uh, especially the dipping. Uh, the dipping reflector is uh, is weaker, and the um, the multiple, the the peg leg multiple of the dipping reflector is a lot weaker. So that's good. The flat uh, multiples are are not that much weaker, um, and uh, so that's a, obviously a problem to be dealt with. Um, but we have a good representation of the flat reflector uh, at, at the top and, and down here at the bottom, and we have uh, a pretty good representation of the, uh, of the dipping reflector. Uh, although notice that the, the, well, the dipping reflector uh, you know, doesn't, uh, doesn't quite meet the, uh, uh, the flat reflector. Uh, and uh, it should get a little bit closer, right? So we're obviously, Got something wrong here. We know from 706 that uh, if this gets uh, migrated, then this uh, dipping reflector should move up, dip, and steepen, and then its top edge will get a little bit closer to the uh, the first reflector as it should. Okay, so that's the the field survey and what we can see in it uh, so far. And um, I just want to show you the multi-offset data uh, in terms of the stacking chart. So we've got uh, this survey had uh, 50 shots at uh, delta s uh, uh, intervals of two meters, and it pushed an off-end spread of 50 receiver groups. So, you know, we're talking, uh, you know, a, a small, uh, you know, student and class scale type of survey, uh, and those uh, receiver groups are at uh, delta g uh, two meter intervals as well. Uh, the minimum offset is zero meters. The maximum offset is uh, ninety-eight meters. Um, and okay, so here's the uh, rule of thumb that you may have heard about when you uh, first did seismic acquisition. That uh, you know, as a rule, there will be separate midpoints at intervals of delta m. Okay, and delta m is going to be uh, one half of the minimum of delta s and delta g. Well, delta s and delta g are both one meter and half of that is half a meter. At each midpoint, then, uh, which is only you know, uh, there there are twice as many midpoints as there are receiver locations, right? So at each midpoint, the maximum fold, the fold is the number of traces summed into each trace of a common midpoint stack. Okay, the maximum fold is going to be half of the number of geophones, fifty, times um, the ratio of uh, delta G over delta S. And in this you know, little survey, it's 1. And so uh, half of 50 is 25. The maximum fold will be 25. Now, of course, you get to the ends of the survey, 
and um, and and of course the uh, the maximum fold degrees is to zero, and you can see here this green trace at the end of the survey. Uh, that is a uh, uh, that is a a trace in the stack at a midpoint that has no has a fold of zero. There's no data that's stacked into that. The one next door to it probably just one trace stacked into that. Okay, so here's a here's a representation of the stacking chart according to the um, uh, according to the 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 kinds of um, um, visualization that uh, of the three of this multi offset and therefore three dimensional data set that we're going to look at. All right, so we still have the x coordinate of the source. Okay, so s. Uh, actually, it's going to climb down. All right, so it's going to increase down from the from the uh, uh, from the top here uh, down to uh, to 100, and then um, it's going to uh, uh, the now you know, we're going to we're going to line up the uh, the shot gathers along these horizontal lines. Okay, so this is the uh, the corrected uh, uh, rhombus, right? And um, the rhombus uh, pushed to a square. So the common offset gathers are going to be vertical. All right, that means that now the the horizontal axis on our stacking chart is now offset. Okay, and just push it up there, and we go through the same process. You know, we look at a trace here. It's at offset 100, so it's at um, you know source 100 meters plus offset of 100 meters. So it's that's at a g coordinate of, of 200 meters, right? And it's source, uh, uh, and so it's at a um, um, uh, its midpoint is uh, is at uh, 100 and uh, uh, and 50 meters, uh, and um, if we look for other ones like, uh, now wait a minute. <coughs> ah, okay, we'll try to get Travis back in here. I'll share the screen again. Sorry, my internet went down. Not fun. Okay. All right. So we've got, um, uh, yeah, OK. Um, and that's the only trace at a midpoint of 150 meters. OK. Um, let's see. You know, here we have a, uh, a trace that has a midpoint of 100 uh, and so forth. You know, here is a trace with a source at 0 and a um, and a and the receiver at zero meters away, so its midpoint is zero. Okay, so now we, we can define the midpoint axis. Okay, and it's um, uh, it actually uh, uh, you know that's the, uh, the the common midpoints are in in this direction. Okay, so that direction is the fold axis. The midpoint axis increases from zero here. Through 100 to 150 over here. <coughs> so if we want to collect together common offset gathers, we get we take a vertical slice of the <coughs> of the stacking chart. Common shot gathers are horizontal slices. Okay, we take this uh, 30 degree angle here. Those are uh, common midpoint gathers. <coughs> All right. So here's the data set. And how did I render that? Um, I took all the positive amplitudes in in a. Uh, this is that same uh, synthetic data set that, that we were looking at the uh, traces of here, the common, the uh, CMP stack and the uh, zero offset uh, section. Nice clean uh, synthetic data set, no noise whatsoever. Um, and notice that I put the uh, the stacking chart on top of it. Okay, so you know now what I was talking about horizontal slices. Well, that's the uh, uh, and and you look at the front right of the volume here, and that's a that's a shot gather. And in fact, that's a shot gather from the shot at 100 meters. 
And uh, on the on the other side, okay, back back here, okay, on the face we can't see, that would be the shot gather from the shot at zero meters. And what's this on the uh, on the front left? Any uh, any ideas? What does it what does it look like? Okay, zero offset. it's the zero offset section. And so that's the front left, and the uh, the, the shot gather is another slice. Yeah, the the shot the shot common shot gather is uh, the front right. Uh, the maximum offset section, you know, the hundred meter offset section, constant offset section would be on the back right. Okay, and now you know we can just slice along this yellow line, and or well, I'm slicing here parallel to the yellow line. And there's a common midpoint gather, you know, and I'm not, you know, I'm not looking directly at it. Um, yeah, so here the uh, the the strong positive amplitudes are represented as as solid objects, and there's just sort of a a, a blue haze uh, for a little atmospheric perspective on the uh, uh, any of the negative amplitudes and the near zero amplitudes. Okay, so this is a volume rendering. I should really uh, figure out how to repeat this in uh, Open Detect. Um, can you look at? Uh, you can you 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 started to figure out how to look at uh, um, um, uh, uh, pre-stack data in, in Open Detect. Yeah, there's there's a glitch. I emailed him over the weekend, and they told me how to resolve it. So I'll be learning that today. Oh, fantastic! Yeah. Okay, let me know what happens. Yeah, for sure. And then I'll want to know, you know, can you can you make a volume rendering of the common yeah, offset? Yeah. Oh, right. All right. So so yeah, you know, I did this on a on a hundred thousand dollar specialized uh, Sun Microsystems computer um, twenty years ago, and um, and uh, now you can do it on any on any laptop. Yeah, you load it as basically like a volume a size of volume. You can look at all the slices that sum to the pre stack depth migration. Right. Right. Yeah. And of course, you can you can only visualize you know one. You can't visualize the whole uh, uh, the whole three D data set and all of its three D shot gathers. You have to you have to visualize one line of uh, one line at a time. Way. Yeah, for, for its pre stack data. Uh -huh. Yeah, and it's very similar to the way that you observe three D in Open Text. It's, it's the exact same thing, except for instead of it being the cross line direction, it's just the uh, all those those common image gathers. Is it the the offset direction or the offset direction? Yeah. Yeah, or or maybe some reduction of you know geometric reduction of the offset somehow. Um, well, well, that'll be great. So uh, this is uh, you know it's taken twenty years to get to this point where you all can uh, can do this yourselves instead of me showing you these ancient images that I made on very specialized machines um, with. Uh, uh, I think just the software alone uh, uh, was supposed to cost ten thousand dollars. Well, th these are great because these show you theoretically what it should look like. If we were to look at the actual data, it wouldn't be so clean. And I and I looked at actual data, and I'm, you'll notice in this class, I'm not showing you any actual data in this way because it's a it's a mess. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay, so uh, and, and we should try putting some synthetics into Open Detect as well, just yeah. to get that. Uh, you know, just to repeat this process. In fact, I, I have all these old shot gathers. It's not a not a huge data set either. If we can output them with uh, RockDoc in Patrol, that'd be nice. I'll see if we can output synthetics in segway format. Yeah. I'm not yeah. sure if you can, but we'll try functionality. Yeah, see, and those those will be cleaner yet because they won't have any multiple reflections in them. Uh, although I do like to look at you know synthetics that are physically correct in that they have the multiple reflections. Um, so yeah, that okay. So the door is now open, you know, really for the first time in uh, in many years. Um, okay, now what have I done here? I've taken this common midpoint gather. In fact, I've taken the whole three D data set, and I've applied a simple NMO correction, not not DMO, but just NMO. And um, so you notice that that in in offset in the offset direction. All the reflections are at the same time. You can see a little bit of um, uh, what do you call it? Enamel stretch at the far ends of the uh, 
you know, we're going to fairly far offset there. So the ZMO stretch. <coughs> um, and you can see that the multiple reflections are, uh, you know, not uh, uh, they're not quite stretching flat. Um, although you know, since this is a, uh, um, we would do a better job if we had included a, if I'd included a, a, a velocity gradient with depth. Um, and now here's a uh, here's another view. This is a this is a since this survey proceeded, it pushed along to. Uh, you know, a, a source coordinate of 100 meters, you know, with the uh, receiver array extending further out to the right, all the way up to 200 meters, right? And um, but then the survey stopped, right? It did not. Um, the survey did not. Uh, um, you know, we didn't roll out of the of the geophone line, okay, which would be standard procedure. Because of that, okay, if we go up to a a midpoint gather that's at the you know, further right midpoints, which is this one uh, here, such as this one here, uh, it's only got far offset traces on it. Okay, and you can see that. So this very rightmost uh, front panel is um, is a far offset midpoint gather, uh, which is very far to the right at the end of the survey. Here's a little bit of shot gather of that last shot gather, and then there's still the zero offset gather on the on the left hand side. And then there's the uh, um, that that's uh, now we see the uh, um, uh, the NMO corrected uh, um, uh, midpoint gather at the far right, uh, where we're starting to get some separation of uh, the uh, the different multiples. Uh, and that can be good or bad. Uh, we're seeing a little bit more of the uh, NMO stretch um, now. If I take this uh, this volume here after NMO correction, so it's going to be like this one, this one here. I take this volume. I'm just going to rotate it around so I'm looking straight at the um, zero offset gather. Okay, so uh, you know here is. Um, uh, uh, I'm looking. No, I'm sorry. I'm looking at the, at the uh, not at the zero offset gather. I'm looking at the. Uh, I'm looking in the offset direction. Okay, so this is what stacking does. Okay, stacking is going to is going to be, um, you know, summing along the lines that we're looking here, uh, in the NMO corrected sorted data, and so you can see why the. Uh, uh, the dipping reflection doesn't stack that well. It stacks weaker because you go out here to the larger offsets, and the NMO correction is is not quite right. It still needs to be have dip move out uh, taken out of it. Okay, so it's a little bit overcorrected, and the multiple especially is overcorrected. You know these parts are way in the back there at the larger offsets. Here's the NMO stretch coming in, and uh, you can see it. The NMO stretch is going to have an effect. A lot of the way through for the uh, the first uh, uh, even the first strong reflector, uh, but it's going to be severe over here on the right hand side where the midpoints are are only uh, sampled by far offset traces, and then here's the the reflection uh, the reflector near the bottom. So uh, you know this view of this data set after uh, NMO correction normal move out correction should look like the um, like the common midpoint stack, and I think it does. Um, so uh, uh, this is just an illustration of the of the standard, uh, you know, really just the standard processes. Okay, so where where are we headed in this class? This is uh, um, an illustration of another um, um, of another synthetic model. Uh, for a while, I was I was making a lot of these synthetic acoustic models, so they had multiple reflections in them, but they were very clean otherwise. Um, here's a uh, migrated. Uh, it had you know very very nice clean um, zero offset data. So there's the zero offset section, and you can start to see uh, you know what the structure should be like. And so if you collapse all these. Uh, all these diffractions you see in the zero offset collapse each diffraction to a point. 
uh, and then um, you know moves this uh, this uh, dipping reflector uh, up dip and steepen it. Okay, then it actually connects. And this is the uh, that was the critical join that I was that I was trying to image actually in a in a real data set uh, uh, a uh, deep crustal data set from uh, um, from Southern California from the Mojave Desert that uh, uh, that uh, I was working on for some time. <coughs> so uh, I wanted to connect the bottom of the basin with the fault that defined the edge of the basin. Uh, this is actually a strand of the Garlock Fault, uh, in, uh, which is an active uh, left lateral strike slip in fault in Southern California. And I could see that join of the bottom of the basin with the, uh, with the fault, this ramp from the fault, uh, properly you know, in the very clean synthetic with the, uh, uh, using the zero, migrating the zero offset data properly. Okay, so uh, and there's the uh, steeper south wall of the uh, basin, which uh, you know the zero offset data don't define really well. Um, there are diffractions which sort sort of show it, uh, but there's other things in here uh, involving multiples as well that uh, maybe are uh, confusing it. All right, so um, this is the structure we're looking for. You know, here's the first arrivals, of course, uh, which we're going to ignore. Here's a um, Here's a, uh, a stack. Okay, it's a CMP stack. It's actually at constant velocity. It, it's it's at the correct constant velocity to see within the basin. Okay, in this synthetic, but all we can see in that CV stack, we see a, a you know a bow tie reflection, and we see the flat bottom of the basin. Okay, now we migrate that to, you know using all the tools we had at our disposal in 706. We migrate that. That CV stack, and we can, you know, sort of connect it to the um, um, <clears throat> uh, we can sort of connect it to the bottom of the basin. But you know, the image of the uh, uh, the image of the of the dipping part, which is actually the Garlock fault trace, uh, you know, which there are scarps in the ground uh, right over here. Um, the dipping part is uh, is too weak. Okay, and it's only producing that little bit of uh, of reflection there. There should be a lot more, as you can see in the uh, um, as you can see in the zero offset data, which of course in the real data are are uh, terrible. Um, so you know, kind of a unsatisfying um, um, you know result from from uh, you know the the migrations that we learned about in seven oh six. Okay, so. Really, what, what 757 is about in, in this first part is how do we get beyond this? Okay? Uh, notice that the only way in this example that I've used the multi offset data is to make the stack. All right? Um, and, so, and that doesn't do that well, even with this nice, clean, synthetic acoustic data set. Okay, how do we do better than that? That's a, uh, that's a real problem. Um, okay, so um, uh, we're going to learn several ways of of going directly to the migration and skipping the uh, the common midpoint stacking idea. We don't, you know, we don't want to totally give up on the common midpoint gather, and certain and the common midpoint gather helps us realize well maybe in some cases we have really good data. When everybody thought, you know, because of a bad stack, that we had terrible data, <clears throat> so we've got to use all the all the power and advantages of of the multi offset data and all the, our ability to cut it into gathers in different directions. But um, at the same time, we've um, we've really got to uh, uh, come up with some some new methods. So. Um, because we're avoiding stacking, we're migrating directly from the pre-stack data. The methods that we're going to talk about are called pre-stack migration, and you've probably heard about PSTM pre-stack time migration and PSDM pre-stack depth migration. And I told you back in 706 that the difference between time migration and depth migration is whether you have assessed 
it, you know, it's it's not really, you know, what software you use or which method you use to migrate. It's actually whether you have done the analysis on the data set to properly assess the lateral velocity contrast, the the velocity variations in x, the v uh, as a function of x. If you've done that work, then you can implement, as we did in, in 706, we, you can implement the thin lens term. Uh, if you've done that work, you can, you can turn your pre-stack time migration into a pre-stack depth migration. And, and I don't know how many um, companies I've, I've this, you know, of course, uh, Optum understands this very, very well. Um, but uh, a lot of other companies and contractors that you talk to, um, especially the seismic contractors, you know, they will build in uh, into their contracts. They'll say, oh, yeah, we'll, we'll depth migrate, you know, your data set. No problem. That's absolutely standard. Okay. But at the same time, they won't do the work necessary and especially not the work necessary, you know, for complex um, data sets like you get from uh, Western Nevada, like you get from um, uh, from volcanic areas. Um, they will not put the work in to properly assess those lateral velocity contrasts, and that is the difference that Optum and I draw between, you know, kind of standard techniques and advanced seismic imaging techniques, as we call them is that we, we actually achieve uh, PSDM, pre-stack depth migration, in, in the, uh, uh, not well, uh, we achieve pre-stack depth migration not just in the contract, not just by throwing, you know, computer uh, routines at it, okay? We achieve it by actually and properly measuring the lateral velocity contrast. That enables the PSDM to actually work and give us something interpretable. Okay? So a big warning there. You know, everybody does PSDM now, uh, but not everybody can do an actual and good PSDM. All right? You have to choose your contractors carefully, and they have to do the work necessary. Uh, okay. So... Um, Let's see. Let me um, let me get you the next notes here. Um, number two. Uh, so how do we start properly? That's what the a lot of the rest of this class is about. Okay, you know how do we get those lateral velocity contrasts? And then once we once we have them, how do we get? How do we use them in a proper pre-stack depth migration, okay? And how is that going to be different? Uh, and why do we need to spend so much time and effort on getting those lateral velocity contrasts? All right. Now, here's uh, something I think that will be of, of interest uh, just at the end of, the, of today's session. So it'll be of interest to uh, those of you looking at uh, amplitude versus offset. Um, so uh, we have, uh, you know, lateral velocity variations. We have lateral reflectivity variations, all right? And uh, we have a, a, a number, we have a survey that goes through here. We'll, we'll just consider it a, a 2D survey for now, 2D world. And um, we've got some observed strong changes in amplitude with offset. And it's all in this, apparently the same reflector. So here's uh, some sketches representing... Uh, uh, common midpoint uh, gathers, and each one has the same uh, direct arrival on it. Okay, these are not corrected for NMO or anything yet. So here is at uh, the common midpoint gather for m equals m zero. This is at m one. This is at m two. And as we move on down the line, we notice oh, you know, well that's an interesting reflector. It it starts out strong. And at uh, medium offsets, it, it kind of dies away, and then uh, and then it finishes strong um, at at the larger uh, at the larger uh, uh, offsets. So that's a you know a two modal kind of, uh, of reflection, and that's a kind of a complicated AVO signal. You know that would 
uh, everything else being equal, that would suggest to us that we had some interesting uh, changes in Poisson's ratio there. Oh, but we just go, you know, we go a little bit down the line to M1, and and the nature of the AVO flips. The amplitude versus offset starts out weak, it's strong in the middle, and then it's uh, and then it's weak again. And we go uh, a little bit further down the line, and it's strong at the beginning and at the middle, and then finishes weak. What is going on? Okay, um, and and this kind of uh, you know lateral change, if you if you have, you know, if if you can make the assumption that this is all one coherent reflector, okay, that represents one physical contrast, and yet its its AVO is changing so drastically from place to place, you're going to suspect that something else is going on. Okay? You know, simple Zopritz type amplitude with offset models are not going to work. The ones you get out of uh, you know, say the uh, modeling programs. Okay, they're 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 not going to work because you're going to have a totally different situation for each of these different uh, each of these different uh, records. But you know, your geologist is telling you, wait a wait a minute, we drilled into that, and you know that's got to be the same one. Um, and uh, and so what gives here? Okay, now recall that small velocity variations can focus and defocus energy. Okay. So if you have a reflection coming up from below, and you have here uh, a little blob of lower velocity, so you know v1 has a lower velocity than the than the material around it v0, all right, then <clears throat> that's going to act like a, a, a